Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce tonight's guest, Christopher Emden. Christopher Emden is the author of the New York Times bestseller for white folks who teach in the hood, and the rest of y'all too. A combination of theory, research, and practical application that offers a helpful approach to teaching in urban classrooms of color. Also the author of Urban Science Education for the Hip Hop Generation, he created the hashtag, wait, there you go, hashtag hip hop ed social media movement and the Science Genius Battles program, which uses rap to engage students with science. Uh, he is a professor of science education at Columbia University, where he is associate director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education and director of the Science Education Program. He is here tonight with his new book, Ratchet Demic, Reimagining Academic Success. Uh, in it, he offers a radical new educational model based on empowering students through the celebration of their unique identities. Um, one author and an author events office favorite, Jacqueline Woodson, praises it thusly. Ratchetdemic is a timely and essential resource for teachers, parents, and whoever else needs this compelling and accessible and above all, absolutely refreshing take on pedagogy. Here's to more and more classrooms being filled with learning, healing, and joy. High praise. Uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, Christopher, thank you so much for being here. And the screen is all yours. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really deeply appreciative for the information. Um, the Free Library of Philadelphia is such an amazing organization. Um, and the work that they do to not only highlight authors from multiple perspectives and multiple voices, but most importantly, to give folks the opportunity to be able to engage in, 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 in the work with the authors, it's just, uh, it should be celebrated. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, and you know, there, when you have events like these, where you're supposed to talk about your book and talk about your work, it usually takes a very um, formal structure. I, I want this to be informal. Um, I want this to be sort of like a natural flowing. So, you know, some folks may not have the book. Some folks may have the book. Some folks may have the audio book. This is not going to be me rehashing the ideas in the book. Uh, for those who don't have it, I want you to go get it so you can get into the, to the depths of it. But this is for me an opportunity to talk about, you know, the reason why I chose to write the book, um, the kind of ideas that lay behind the book that, that, that sort of undergirt the, the concepts and theories that, that are in the book, how this book is an evolution of uh, my previous work. And, and then maybe, maybe talk a little bit about some of the narratives within the, within the book that I, that I think is important for folks to be able to pick up on. Um, the first thing I would say is that, you know, I'm an educator, right? I'm a, I'm a teacher at the end of the day. A lot of folks have teacher as like a piece of their identity. You know, it's like, you know, I am a, you know, a public speaker and teacher, or I am a, a, a politician or a pundit and teacher. I, I censor um, my, my identity as teacher, but I also view teaching and the enterprise of teaching and the idea of being a teacher as, as a, as a way of being that, that many people can hold. Like, to teach is not to hold a credential to teach, right? To teach is to be able to have a certain um, identity that, 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 that is centered on being able to be a force in the world to allow information to be distributed to other people, to be able to be a, in service um, of the learning of other folks, to be able to ask questions, to pose ideas, and to make people feel as though aspects of who they are that it needs to be unearthed are unearthed by your presence. So I walk in the world as a teacher. And academic matters to me because to be a teacher has in the contemporary world been viewed as having a very particular identity, right? You know, teachers are smart and they walk a cer certain way. They talk a certain way. They have a certain uh, degree, a certain credential, uh, certain training, a certain understanding of curriculum, a certain understanding of certain understanding of standards. They, they know their content areas. There are all these things that are attached to being a teacher that I feel kind of like obfuscates the, 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 the core thing about teaching, which is about radical honesty, radical truth, um, creating context for radical welcoming and, and being a little bit, a little bit extra, a little bit loud, a little bit, a little bit um, performative. And I think that the best teachers in the world, whether they're in the classroom or in the world at large, have an element of their identity that is about being a little bit more. And that little bit more um, is a piece of the self that society oftentimes pushes to the margins and says like not welcome in academic spaces or not welcome in intellectual spaces. 
um, you know, you know, like you know, a person who comes to the world who is an amazing storyteller is not necessarily viewed as a teacher per se. They're a storyteller outside of being a being being a teacher, a person who has a way of commanding an audience, uh, a person who who works in the pursuit of of of, of radical freedom and, and and social justice for the world. Um, is viewed as something other than a teacher. And like my work is about, you know, we gotta bring them worlds together. And those worlds come together when we identify that not only are there folks who are amazing teachers beyond those with a teaching credential, but there are folks who are amazing teachers who, who don't at all fit within what is perceived to be um, the, 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 the larger intellectual tradition. Uh, in the book, I write about early you know, the folks that I've been inspired by to help me be a better teacher. And, you know, I talk about um, bus drivers and cabbies and, and Pentecostal black preachers and, 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 um, and barbers and, 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 and sisters in a beauty salon. And, you know, all these folks who have a way of commanding the interest of an audience. Uh, these folks who know how to be able to sort of manipulate their voice in just the right way to make somebody who is a client want to keep coming back for more. I mean, folks who go to the hood and go back to a barber that's giving them a bad haircut year after year because they feel comfortable in that barber's chair. And there's something that that barber does that I feel can be identified as being a little bit ratchet. And so in a book, like I really redefine or define rather, you know, ratchet. You know, for me, ratchet is a way of knowing, a way of being, a way of expressing. It's also... Um, and I write about this in Ratchetdemic, like it's also, if you're coming from, from a, first, a certain sort of Northeastern hip hop tradition, you know, to be ratchet is to, you know, or to have the ratchet is to have a, a weapon, a secret weapon, you know what I mean? Like phrases like, don't be tripping, I got the ratchet on me, means that this person has a weapon, um, oftentimes a gun, and that, 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 that ratchet can be released and revealed at any time, and when released and revealed, can invoke attention, for good or bad, in another audience. And then I also draw from like a little boozy-esque, New Orleans-esque um, Southern tradition of ratchet as a, you know, as, as somebody being a little much, you know, a little, a little, a way of knowing and being. I even critique these, um, these, you know, YouTube videos of, 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 of brothers, men of color, who in many ways are sort of like performing a caricature of black women in a way that is problematic, but saying that those sisters are ratchet. And so, for me, I think about ratchet as tool, ratchet as weapon, ratchet as a way of knowing and being. I want to bring all those things together and say that to be expressive and be honest and authentic and to be raw and to be pure in the sort of Southern tradition um, is in the Northeastern tradition, a secret weapon that can be utilized as a tool to unleash the intellect, the magic and the academic potential of a particular population. So ratchetemic is a way of knowing and being that says, these binaries that are constructed that separates being ratchet from being academic, separates being expressive from being a good teacher, separates having a credential from, from not, um, to like sort of like really bring those, those binaries and, and deconstruct them and then reimagine a way forward in the world. And so that's like the undergirding sort of like philosophy and theory of, of, of ratchetemic. I also am really upfront about identifying the, the reality that modern schooling censors whiteness and and that and that the censoring of whiteness is not really a censoring of like you know whiteness and, and phenotype but it's a censoring of of white supremacist ideologies that oftentimes perceive black forms of expression as being inherently non-academic and non-intellectual and 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 that when schooling censors certain ideologies about ways to perform intelligence that are oftentimes attached to respectability what happens is that folks who have their own expressive ways of knowing and being are perceived as being less than. And let's, let's for example, think about like this presentation, right? You know, you know I, I'm coming to the Free Library of Philadelphia. You know, I'm not wearing a tie. You know, I'm not wearing a dark suit. You know, I, I, I kept my hat on. You know, some folks, probably not the, you know, 50 something of y'all who's joining the talk, you know, would see uh, an academic or a scholar who's talking about a book and look at my aesthetics and say, well, this, this is probably not a serious scholar or, this is not a serious academic or, or, you know, why is he so concerned with those superficial things? And I, I think that for black folks in America, 
who have oftentimes gone through an experience that have robbed them of, of, of not just agency, but, but forms of expression that speak to their humanity and, and that devalue their expressiveness, like the attachment to the value for the, um, the brilliance within just our aesthetic tradition, like the way a black dude cocks his hat, for example, is not understood in academic spaces. But I think that, that oftentimes because it's perceived as not academic, you know, I, 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 I operate in an academic world that looks at how I show up aesthetically and, and then defines me as non-intellectual, non-academic. And if I was unaware of my own intellectual and academic potential, I may be inundated with all these images and figures about who I'm supposed to be that are thrown at me that will make me doubt my own intellectual prowess, right? And we think about young folks in schools, you know, if their pants hang down a little low, if they're a little loud, they're a little extra, um, it's not even that they don't see themselves as intelligent, it's that teachers, the school system doesn't see them as intelligent, doesn't see value in them. And so as such, because all of the adults in their lives within the school building sees how they show up as being less than, they start receiving the message really quickly that they are less than. And oftentimes then they only get attention from educators based on their um, performance of these identities that have nothing to do with their aesthetics, but that institutions have attached to their aesthetics. So if I walk in and I'm a little bit like, if I, you know, I rock a certain color or somebody says, oh, that looks like a like gang culture, like, and that's not smart. I start getting that that's not smart. I also start getting that that means gang culture. And then I start performing you know, gang culture. I start performing what the world projects on me. And if the world tells me that's not academic, I start performing academic, um, like I start performing of being unacademic or, or, or non-intellectual or not valuing school. And, and so I think that there's this, there's this dimension of teaching and learning about the absence of freedom. Like it ain't no um, accident that we are here at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Like, you know, the, 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 one, of the, one of the tenets of Ratchademic is like, yo, the chief mechanism to activate the genius of any individual is their freedom. Like I gotta feel welcome, comfortable, and free to be myself first before I can soak in information. And so I write in a book about that phenomenon and I write about the kind of like, um, the, 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 how taxing it is and how emotionally and psychologically draining it is to always have to perform a version of yourself that you're not um, to be seen as 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 smart, but but what I what I try to do in the book is not just talk about this in the context of teaching and learning as it relates to students. I'm also very explicit in the book about talking about teachers and how teachers themselves learn to perform some version of teacher that is not who they authentically are, for the sake of acceptance by the 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 the, the, the infrastructure the infrastructure of schools, and so that teachers themselves have learned to. While, while young folks are robbed of the opportunity to express their ratchet selves and be ratchetemic, both ratchet and academic, teachers have learned to be able to tuck away their ratchet selves in a pursuit of an academic persona that robs them of the ability to be able to connect to young folks. So anybody who works with young folks know, if you're an educator and you ain't got no swag, you ain't got no presence, particularly in urban America, um, you have nothing about you that makes me want to connect to you because you've tucked that away, I, as a student, don't feel like there's anything to connect to. And a teacher who's engaging with a young person, and a young person has nothing to connect to, the, 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 the teacher's only teaching um, to the mind of that young folks that have not activated the soul. And I write in the book about how, like, the, you know, you can't touch the mind if the soul ain't activated. And so, you know, that's like a key piece of the joint. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I, I trouble this really deeply because I, like, I don't want to make the the argument that like a rash academic identity to be constructed in the classroom with young folks or teachers is something that like, Chris Emden came up with. It's not, right? So I, I write about Septima Clark um, historically, you know, a black woman who was like anti-respectability, raw, unapologetic, loud, um, expressive. And at the same time was this amazing educator who, who led folks to, to understand the meaning of citizenship and democracy. And so I couch this rachademic approach in a historical tradition of, of Black folks who teach. And I'm really intentional about naming teaching and preaching as one and the same. And that, you know, your best, your best preachers got a little ratchet energy and how they convert the um convert the um the folks in the church. You know what I mean? And, I, and so I, I try to like, you know, bring in a bit of the value for the aesthetic, 
a bit of the value for the um for the for the uh, intellectual tradition, but also like try to couch it in the contemporary. And so that's like the largest sort of like overall kind of like, you know, underpinning of the book. And then there's the, um, the intro who, that was written by Jessica K. Moore. Jessica K. Moore is a brilliant poet who in this, in, like you buy the book cause it's good and amazing ideas in it. Like buy the book for Jessica K. Moore's introduction and the way that she articulates the tensions that come with being a black mother who's sending her black child to school, who wants that child to have a good education, but all the places where that child is getting a good education means that, that child learns how to devalue himself, right? So she's talking about taking a child to a private school where he has to cut off his locks and his hair because that's part of the school rules, taking the kid to a school where they, the kid doesn't have to ask questions. And, and so she articulates the kind of like, so the book is written for educators and written for folks who see themselves as teachers, even if they're outside of the classroom, but she also opens up this beautiful world of the kind of tensions that exist in this world where black folks are persistently chasing this idea of being better, being accepted, a better education, a better schooling system, a better, like we are always in a pursuit of better without recognizing that this pursuit of better is oftentimes framed as um, you as you are is less than. So like better is always like not yourself. And if not yourself is always better and you're persistently in a pursuit of better, then you're, 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 you're going towards this better that's attached to a hatred or a despising of your authentic self. And, and like, you know, one of my favorite sayings that I, that I always share with folks is like, you know, education is not a tool for making your way out of the neighborhood. It's a tool for going to improve it. But we, we bought into this notion that we're always like, you know, making our way out. And it's not just making our way out of a neighborhood. Like we're learning through contemporary schooling in America to make our way out of our bodies, make our way out of our expressiveness, make our way out of our truth, make our way out of all of the magic that is blackness that is birthed out of the beauty of our experiences in this nation and across the world, right? Like, like the, 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 the kind of stylistic superiority of black folks um, is birthed out of being oppressed, right? And, and, and like, you know, you when you when you when you think about it, other folks don't have the gift of having gone through uh, what black folks had to go to and go through in America just to be. And and I I say that and I play with this idea in the book a lot, like to recognize that like our struggles are our gift because out of our struggles come this way of being in the world, this way of storytelling, this way of rapping, this way of using your hands. Way of using your voice, this way to this way of being able to exist in the world that other folks just don't have because they ain't gone through what you went through. And for those folks who've not gone through what you went through, when you learn to let go of the things that made you who you are, what inevitably happens is that you are now pursuing the less than this that they are. Like they hold a credential, you hold a credential. Now you're having conversations with folks who hold the same credential as you do based on their norms of what it means to be academic. So it's like based on their way of talking, engaging. And so they've convinced you to let go of who you are in the pursuit of who they are, utilizing their rules of engagement. So their rules of engagement judge what you are. So even if you got the credentials they got, your, your credential has less value because your ways of knowing and being are not what they have. So my argument is like, yo, if they ain't gonna let you in the way you are, you might as well be as smart as they are and hold your truth, right? And so it's the pursuit of, 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 of learning, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of, um, the pursuit of, 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 like of, of, of being uh, informed about the world without all the whackness that comes with it. You know what I mean? Like, like to be PhD'd up, you know, without the, without, the, without the inability of being able to engage with the lay person that comes with it, right? To be able to be a scholar and a thinker and an intellectual without the, the, the oddness and the off-puttingness and the and the only able to engage with folks who are like you, like 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 to be, you know, to have swag and be smart matters, and that that model needs to get created for young folks. So anyway, I've said a lot about, you know, I mean, a larger um framework of the book. Now I want to get into the chapters and what I what I tried to do in the book then is like, you know, I, you know, I wrote the joint like an MC, um. Which means like, you know, there are lines that, you know, 
like as, as a person who loves hip hop, you know, the best hip hop songs to me are those where you, you, you hear the song for the hundredth time. And then like the hundred and first time you go back and hear a line all over again and you say, Oh my gosh, that's what that meant. And so they're like, they're, 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 they're you know, there's, there's double entendres in there and there's wordplay in there and there's, um, and there's, uh, you know, what I try to call like, um, you know, a lyrical sorcery there where I, 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 I leave with an idea in a, in an opening chapter and I bring it back up in chapter five and then I close it up in chapter seven. Um, but I, but I hide it in a new concept. And, and so, you know, I, I tried to like write the concept of Rashademic, you know, philosophically that's there. But I also tried to write the book itself in a rachademic way that, you know, that has citations and references and shouts out amazing scholars who've informed my thinking. But at the same time, I'm writing a book in a way for those who are able to pick up the little jewels in the joint to be able to make sense of the ideas. And I do that oftentimes through stories. So every single chapter has um, really profound storytelling. Um, you know, chapter one, I write about Dr. White, an experience that a professor had with uh, a new professor, a new black professor had with a more seasoned uh, academic and, and the ways that this new academic and this older, more seasoned academic were having conversations, but not saying the same thing because the new academic had not yet lost their ratchet. And so they're looking to, to find a mentor, but the person who's more seasoned had lost their sauce, their essence a long time ago and the challenges that come with that. And then I, through that Dr. White story, I, I play out some phenomena that go on in K through 12 education and play out some phenomena with teacher training and then play out like just some ideas about how to be in the world. Um, so like that, that's like the anchor of that chapter. You know, chapter two is entitled Oreo where I, I really draw this sort of like extended metaphor. So one of, one of my favorite MCs is Lupe Fiasco. What Lupe Fiasco does really well is that he He'll, he'll drop a, a, a metaphor that usually another rapper would sort of exhaust in two lines. And, and what Lupe does, like he'll extend that for a whole 16 bars. And so what I try to do with the Oreo chapter is like I gave this example of the Oreo cookie and I compared the Oreo cookie to um, the experiences of teachers or black educators or black scholars or black thinkers um, who have made it, quote unquote, um, their credentials, they have degrees, they have a job, they're a teacher, but yet they are holding up uh, the white filling of the Oreo. And so I, I, I really delve into this really um, rich metaphor of what the white filling of the Oreo stands for. I talk about the cream filling of the Oreo. I talk about Nabisco telling us the Oreo is America's favorite cookie, even though there's no actual evidence that that's the case. I talk about how brown cookies hold up white filling in the or like in the Oreo cookie, um, how how brown brown folks hold up white supremacist ideologies and oftentimes play that out in the world because they lost their ratchet, um, and so like I really use that metaphor throughout. And for those who, who might catch it, like the first chapter is called Doctor White because the second chapter is talking about the white cream filling of the Oreo, and the third chapter that talks about ratchetist tool talks about how does the or the brown cookies of the Oreo tether away from the white filling. And so like even the chapters, so there's like a, their narratives in the, the, the chapters are narratives. Then the, um, there's stories in the chapters and then the chapter titles are giving you hints of where to come. And I'm, I'm just leaving that open for folks to be able to engage with. And throughout the book, I drop these concepts that in many ways, like as, as a more seasoned scholar now, it's crazy to say this, like, you know, there, there's so many powerful ideas that not one one teacher, educator, or one scholar, one thinker in education cannot fully give give like you know give all to. And so throughout the book, I drop these concepts that I that I'm hoping that younger scholars can pick up and that teachers can pick up to utilize when they make sense of how they teach young folks. Like so, I, I you know I write about plantation pedagogies where I'm drawing connections between the education in the slave quarter, um, um, looking at Thomas Weber's work um, in Deep Like the Rivers and talking about how the education in the slave quarter looks a lot like contemporary schooling and looks a lot like NCAA sports and, and how black bodies have been rendered disposable by this infrastructure that refuses to pay them but actually makes them work on literally a field. And so like, you know, you're talking about slaves on cotton fields and you talk about young black athletes on football fields um, that, and, and that the football field is borrowing the same structure as the slave plantation, but also K through 12 education is playing that out as well. 
And we're not just talking about white folks who are like the slave masters. We're also talking about, you know, the house Negro phenomena, which may be black educators in schools who are playing this out. So like, so I, I you know, I'll, I'll drop a little jewel on that. You know, I, I talk about plantation pedagogies. I talk about uh, educational Stockholm syndrome, where, where, where a person who's been assaulted by an institution or insulted by a, by a, a, a criminal or whoever else develops this, this sort of affection for that institution. So I'm, I'm, I'm dropping these jewels throughout the joint, right? And like the hope is that, that folks can take those ideas and concepts and run with them on their own, even as they're following this larger theme around, uh, around ratchetemics. So chapter one is Dr. White. Then from Dr. White, I talk about the Oreo with the white filling. So in many ways, Dr. White, that character becomes the white filling of the Oreo, even though it's a sister as I play the scenario out. And then, you know, chapter three, Ratchet as Tool is where I start really, really playing with the concept of Ratchet, right? Like, you know, nodding to a lot of scholars who've done amazing work on Ratchetness, uh, you know, like uh, particularly sisters, like, you know, like, you know, Brittany Cooper's of the world and, and like, uh, like just amazing scholars who are like playing with the concept of Ratchet and, and, um, and, and Terry Pickens. And, and like, I'm like offering my own contribution to that literature on, on, on Ratchet as it relates to Ratchet as a, as a shared, as a shared, um, a, like, a, like as a tie that binds black folks, you know what I mean? Even if they try to run away from it. And, and so like, I start playing with, you know, Ratchet's tool. I tell a story in that chapter about just like me going out and, you know, trying to buy a bed and buying this bed that I had to put together myself as opposed to years of where you would go to a furniture store and buy your own bed. And then I'm, I, I talk about like how, and this literally happened, you know, I buy, I buy this bed and I'm like, oh man, I gotta put this together myself. It's a lot harder to put together myself, but I can't put the bed together unless I have a ratchet. And literally I, I bought this bed offline and I got this little, this little thing that says, you know, this is your ratchet, this is your tool. Um, it tightens and it loosens and makes life easier. And I was like, oh my gosh, this traditional notion of the ratchet, the ratcheting tool uh, as the, like, as like ratchet expression becomes the ratchet tool and I talk about how I had to find this ratchet to put my bed together. And I had a lot of more powerful tools. I had a drill that usually is supposed to make work easier. Like I have all these amazing advances, technological advances that you hand over to young folks in schools, but really all you need is your ratchet. When I got the ratchet, I could put my bed together. I could sleep on it, it was more comfortable. And I, you know, I just play with the metaphor of what it means to create a schooling system where young folks are able to create their own education um, because they're able to articulate what they need because they are being valued for who they are and not judged and seen as less than because of it. So like that ratchet is two chapter, I'm playing with that idea. Um, and I, you know, and, and like in the midst of all this, y'all, let's, let's, I also wanna make it clear, like I'm, I'm kind of still making it plain, right? Like, you know, one thing I made sure I did as I talk about these grand ideas is like at the end of the book, I have these um, sections that are discussion questions so that you could read a chapter and you can have a book study based on discussion questions that are in the book already. Cause I also wanted to, I wanted to, again, I wanted to be academic, right? I wanted to be highbrow and intellectual and philosophical and theoretical and all that. I wanted to give some practical examples of some stories to keep it, keep it real. And then I wanted to give teachers something to offer so that, so that I, I also was literally thinking about the three descriptions of ratchet that I offered as tool, as way of being, and, and, um, and a secret weapon. And then I wanted, I wanted the book in itself to serve as a ratchet, right? That it can give you philosophy, it can give you practical, and it can give you discussion questions. Um, dang, it's 801 already, I'm almost done. So that's chapter three. Chapter four, I talk about ratchet as being and freeing. Um, I, I really tell this powerful story about a, a gang in New York called the Decepts. Anybody who's from New York in the 90s knows about the Decepticons. Uh, these kids that came out of Brooklyn Second Floor High School, they were perceived as like the, the biggest, most thug gangsters of all time. And they literally were just a bunch of kids who were super smart, tested to get into the school, but were not seen, were not heard, were not given value. And, and, they, and they created a gang based on a cartoon character that embody their experiences in the world. And I talk about how we are all, or have been and can be complicit in naming folks as problematic when they have things to offer. And that's not playing with like some really interesting ideas, like uh, the super predator idea that came in the, in, you know, in the, in the early Clinton era um, and how that played a role in how young folks learned how to perform things that are not, that were not who they were, um, despite their, beside their brilliance and their, and their genius, you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, man, in chapter, chapter four, I talk about rats as being and freeing. I tell these stories about these decepts and I was able to witness firsthand. And, you know, I can't, I don't want to tell you the whole book, but I talk about how we can create situations in classrooms and in the world right now, where we don't keep replicating the system of oppression that forces young folks to 
come to, to become things that are not who they are for the sake of the comfort of the larger power structure that always sees them as less than. Um, and, and then in, in that joint, I saw, you know, and then I start playing with, um, with, you know, this idea of like, you know, you go to get a formal education and then you learn to become cheap, right? You, you know, you learn to become complicit and you learn to become um, sort of like, like this sort of like disaffected and um, human being. And, and so I play with, uh, with this concept of Dolly the sheep and cloning. And I also play with this idea of the black sheep of a family and, and this really powerful quote that I stumbled upon from a New York Times article a couple of years back that says, you know, in the absence of the black sheep, the white sheep will find which one amongst them is a little bit gray. So I talk about this idea where in society, we are always looking for someone to ostracize. And oftentimes the pursuit of finding someone to ostracize leads us to create the sort of like, whoever is like me is good, whoever is not isn't. And so I, I talk about sheep and excellent sheep and, and schooling and, and, um, and school graduation through that process. I, I'll, you know, I tell us, I mean, I don't want to say like my, all my stories is ill, but I, there's another really powerful narrative in that chapter that, you know, y'all got to cop the book to, um, to read the joint. Um, so yeah, and then chapter five is this like centering anchor, right? Um, it's called Elevators, Haters, and Suckers. It's probably my favorite chapter. Did I, did I say my Oreo chapter was my favorite chapter? I think this is my favorite chapter. And I just talked about, uh, you know, if like in my head, I'm like, if you buy the Dr. White narrative and why it matters to understand it, if you understand this idea of being an Oreo, you understand being back to this pool, you understand back to this being in free, and, and freeing, you, you, after you've read the first four chapters, I've kind of tried to write the book in a way where at this point, you are motivated to want to go do something in the world. Like you're motivated to want to go deconstruct the structures of traditional schools that make young folks feel disengaged. You know what I mean? And then if you feel that, you're, I have to like, I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't equip you with a way of looking at the world to help you to be able to overcome the challenges that will come when you try to be academic, when you try to be both rational and academic concurrently. Um, and so I talk about elevators, haters, and suckers, and I use the elevator as a, as an analogy to describe the folks in your life who are there destined to take you higher. Um, haters as those, y'all know who haters are, who, who just refuse to see you for who you are and the light that you offer the world. And which is, and, and a lot of us are haters to young folks. And I talk about suckers who are fundamentally opposed to the notion of those who we see, who society has deemed as less than ever becoming anything other than what you decided they should be. And so I write about how do you learn to deal with that? Like, how do you deal with a hater in your school building, right? When you're doing the right work and you're connecting the young folks, like how do you deal with the person next door who like can't stand you just because you're doing good work? Um, and how do, you, how do you learn to be able to learn your ratchet and find your ratchet? And I, th I don't think, I think it was, yeah, I think it was around this point where I started talking about like, you know, for, for white educators, like, yo, you got a ratchet too. And like the notion of ratchetness as being like the sort of like urban black phenomena of their loudness alone is problematic. And so I start playing with this idea, like, yo, this golf ratchet, this suburban ratchet, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, and, and start playing with this idea, like ratchetness as authenticity. And how do you, how do we all return back to our authentic selves? Um, and how do we do these like really powerful interrogations of who we are and then learn how to marry who we are to who we need to be, not just for young people, but for ourselves. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, that, that, that's um, chapter five, chapter six, I, I start I talk about cages and conditioning. Um, here I, I delve into a little bit of my science background. So I like, so one through four was like the setup, you know what I mean? Then five was like, if you, if you really bought this life, you about to move with me like rock out with me on this elevator hitters and suckers. And then like six, seven, eight, I start, I start going back into almost like, almost like set you into this concept of ratchetness and ratchetemic. Then I, I give you like a, a pause to take a breath and think about how that plays out in your, in your classroom experiences, your teaching, your learning, et cetera. And then I, I'm like, okay, if you buy the elevator hitters and suckers idea, then I got to pun intended, ratchet it up another level with, um, the kind of information about being ratchet. And so talk about this cages and conditioning phenomena, I delve into like epigenetics and, and how, you know, certain populations have developed and either an affinity for, or a, or, or like an aversion for not education, not learning, but certain forms of education and learning. And, and about how that, that historical and epigenetic biological phenomenon plays out in schools and classrooms. 
And so you could have a young person in the classroom who just like will not learn from an educator who refuses to connect, like just outrightly refuse. It's a child who loves learning, but won't learn from you because you have not learned how to be able to engage on my cultural turf. And we don't have a rationademic exchange going on. And, and I talk about how do you name that? How do you identify that? And then most importantly, how do you overcome that? Um, and so um, tell a story about mice in uh, biological research and, 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 and cages, et cetera. And it's, it's a really, I think, uh, a really compelling way of making sense of how do you apply what you've learned in the first five chapters into a, a more deeper understanding of how to teach. Um, so that's, that's the um, cages and conditioning chapter. You know, chapter seven, I build on that. Like I said, five is less hiatus, and then six, seven, eight takes you on another journey. So seven talks about clones and cloning and replication of ideas and um and, and talks about how the structure of schooling became what they are, why it is what it is, um, how young how and why young folks respond to it. And I also like in that chapter, I start, I start um moving us towards the last of the chapters, which is now like a weaving of the concepts in the book together for the audience um, and folks who are reading it. Um, so yeah, so I talk about clones, cloning as a metaphor, then chapter eight, soul wounds and white gauze. And in there, the anchor story is, it, it talks about like, you know, like when, when a person is wounded, um, it's important for the wound to breathe. And it's a weird thing to say because sometimes when a wound is ugly, we have a tendency to want to wrap the wound up. And so I say like, let's say ratchetness was birthed out of the wounding of particular populations. And they're, 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 they're experiencing a sort of epigenetic phenomena that causes them to respond to the world in very visceral ways, right? And this is what we name as ratchet. But once the ratchet, which is the wound has been revealed it's important for us to allow it to be exposed to the air, to, to breathe. But once it's exposed, I, we, we oftentimes try to wrap it up in white gauze. And pun intended with white gauze, it's like, you know, it's white norms, or, you know, sort of like just button it up. And I, I say, if you try to cover it up, the wound will either not heal or it will bleed through. And when it bleeds through on your pretty white gauze, don't blame the wound for bleeding through, blame you for not treating the wound or allowing it to breathe. And so I take that metaphor and I just build on it. Um, and I, like I low key, low key, I start connecting that joint back to the Oreo chapter. So like, I'm always like bringing a new idea and then referencing an old idea and then bringing something that's like kind of off-putting, like literally, I, I don't know if this is, is, is okay for y'all. Like when I, when I, when I wrote Ratchademic, uh, I thought about one of my favorite rappers who's Pharaoh Monch. Pharaoh Monch has this really interesting cadence when he raps it's like da, 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 da. like it's like every other word can or cannot rhyme the internal rhyme schemes but at the end of the verse you see the pretty picture and so like i wrote this like as an mc and you know i'm a i'm a hip-hop educator and it was really important for me in writing this like i didn't want to say like here's a hip-hop book you know like that was lame i think i think that that we are at a point with hip-hop education and hip-hop scholarship where you don't have to name it as hip-hop for it to be hip-hop like sometimes what your pen do you know what i mean like when you write the bars, those who know, know. And those who don't know may not be familiar with it. Like some may read this book, I'm like, oh, it's a nice read. Some will read the book and see what I was trying to do with my pen and how I was trying to pheromonch it, you know, as I wrote it. And, you know, if it goes over some heads, so be it. But the idea is to create a hip hop, like a ratchet hip hop book in academic prose. Um, and, you know, you guys buy the book at Uncle Bobby's and read it and let me know if I was successful in that endeavor. But anyway, so I write about soul wounds, white goals, extend that metaphor, and then and then get to frenemies and energy. And in 2017 or maybe 18, I delivered the keynote at South by Southwest. And you know, it's an ed tech conference for all these folks who profess to want to do well about education, but they're like these ed tech gurus who who may not who so, who so, so they profess to be friends of education, but come with a philosophy that's about making as much money off young folks as possible. And so when I wrote chapter nine, I literally based it off of that talk at um, that keynote at, at South by Southwest. And, and I, 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 so I, I, I came with the energy from that talk, but then I started connecting it to like W.E.B. Du Bois and um, his experience as a teacher in the hills of Tennessee and trying to go find a job at a school to teach and this 
you know, this girl named Josie and Josie is this loud and enthusiastic girl about learning, but, but the structures at play robbed her of, of her expressiveness and her joy for learning. And over time, she ended up not getting a formal education because of life. And this is like, a, you know, it's a story that Du Bois writes about. And, and I try to like build on that story by talking about how someone can show up as a friend but may have enemy intentions or may show up as a friend with friend intentions, but have enemy execution or may show up as a friend and be a part of uh, an infrastructure or a structure of schooling that is an enemy to the souls of young folks. You know what I mean? And like, if that's the case, what does that, what does that mean? How does that play out? And how do we undo that? You know what I mean? How do we reverse that? So that's chapter nine. I'm gonna close out soon, I promise y'all. Um, chapter 10, I, I write about towards healing. I think all of this oftentimes leads us to, to, to um, you know, when, when, when folks don't feel free enough to learn and to be themselves and are always performing to be something that's not who they are, even when they pursue intellectual pursuits or academic pursuits to get a credential, they'll always have this internal dialogue about like, am I good enough? And that's sort of imposter syndrome phenomenon. And so I, I wrote about imposter syndrome and I, and I made the argument that being academic is the cure for imposter syndrome. And so I write about it from a true experience as a, you know, as a professor in an institution, watching these kids graduate, these brilliant black, brown students, first generation graduates graduate. And still at their graduation, they're, they're like, I don't know how I made it. Don't know if I'm good enough. Like they have this self doubt, even, if they, even after they've overcome the obstacle. And so I make the argument that like in K through 12 education, when you don't welcome the academic identity, some of these kids will never even get the higher education, but then some who make it through this oppressive structure and process also end up broken. And so how do we heal imposter syndrome by allowing folks to, you know, find this sort of like interstitial spaces where they can construct these hybridized identities and how can teachers support that and how can teachers develop that for themselves and then model it for young folks. So that's, yeah, that's chapter 10. And I've been talking a lot, y'all. I'm just trying to give y'all an overview of the book. And then chapter 11 is like the get back. Like, yo, how do we get back what's been robbed us of? Like, you know, I, I, you know, I say that, you know, a lot of folks have been born with a small diamond that's worth billions. But the seduction of a, of, a, of a large cubic zirconia with no value whatsoever seems seductive. And you drop your diamond in pursuit of this thing that's shiny, but has little value. And how do you, how do you, learn, a, how do you learn to understand the diamond that you hold? And how do you learn to mine the diamonds within? And how do you learn to see the value in it? And then how do you learn to be academic and then utilize that in the world that's not designed for you? So that's what that uh, chapter 11 is. Um, every time I see chapter 11, I think of bankruptcy, sorry. So, but it's a, it's a ill joint there. Like, you know, folks who are emotionally and morally bankrupt, how do you get back what you've lost? And then chapter 12, restitution of rescue, restitution of rescue missions. One of my favorite chapters, although I know I said that before, you know, I, I hope it's okay to say that I just love this book, you know, not, not like, cause I'm, yo, like I, I wrote the hell out this book, man. You know, I, I poured my soul into it. I told some vulnerable stories. Um, I thought deeply about what I wanted to share and why I wanted to share it. I made sure it made sense. Um, and so, you know, the last chapter, I just talked about the rights of the body as articulated in, in Buddhist tradition, you know, through um, Eastern body, Western mind. Like, what are these rights that we all deserve? And how do we make sure that we give those rights back to young folks who've been robbed of it? How do we give the rights back to the ratchet so they can see their academic. Um, how do we become ratchetemic? So that's like in a nutshell, um, my book, Ratchetemic Reimagining Academic Success. I thank you all so much for being here at the Free Library of Philadelphia to hear me muse about aspects of it. Um, if you have questions, I'll answer them. Um, but you know, pick up the book and I, I hope, I hope, I hope that you learn something from it and I hope it moves and inspires you. Um, Jason, what up? Hey, you didn't even have to, you didn't even have to call me back. Here I am. Look at that. I love uh, it. And like you, I did not wear a tie tonight. So sorry. <laughs> um, so we have some questions coming in and let's try to get to as many of them as possible. All right. Um, this is, and if I mispronounce your name, well, I'm so sorry. I will do my best. I, I believe this is from Chardet. Uh, it says, how can teachers particular, uh, how can teachers continue to embed CRP in states where CRT is being banned. I'm presuming critical race practice. Great theory. And critical yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yo, check us out, fam. And this is important for everybody who's listening to, to understand. These people who are banning critical race theory don't even know what they're banning. 
like, you know, you cannot run being fearful of a ban of, of a thing where they don't know the thing. Yo, so my answer is just do your work. And, and, and first and foremost, and I've said this a million and one times in interviews and such, I did a, um, uh, an NPR joint the other day when I was like, yo, yo, this critical race theory ban is weapons of mass distraction. It's literally constructed for us to be so afraid of just teaching that we become script followers. Um, and folks don't even know what, what they're banning and what it looks like. And so, you know, I think educators just have to be honest about not operating with fear around this and for justifying what they do in good pedagogy. Like, I don't like this, it's critical race theory. No, it's good teaching. Why? Look, why use whoever they listening to? They talk about, do we say, do we said it? Entering the child's mind or whatever. It's Dewey, it's Piaget, it's Vygotsky, it's all that. It's good teaching, except for sentences towards the needs of particular populations. So for me, I don't want to be dismissive and I don't want to be glib, right? I understand the trauma that comes with the fear of like, they're banning this, what do I do? And like, I think the, the title of my next book is gonna be, yo, don't worry, just teach. Just teach, beloved. Do what's right for young folks and you're gonna be all right. Also, we have to understand a sleight of hand is at play here. Like CRT, critical race theory, being also CRT, culturally relevant teaching, it's not an accident. And so folks cannot ban culturally relevant teaching because that's good teaching. So they'll ban CRT to make you feel like they're banning the other CRT to rob you from doing the actual CRT. And yo, just teach, fam. We're going to be all right. In the words of Kendrick Lamar. Do you feel like that's a tactic, uh, just, you know, another boogeyman catchword kind of thing that, that's, that's used now just as kind of a, you know, a, oh, here's a thing that, I, you know, do you feel like it's just, just thrown out there? Absolutely. I think it's, it's, so one is thrown out there arbitrarily. Of course, there are folks in the political world who wants to throw it out there and it garner some attention, they 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 just they they latch on to it, not because they even but not because they believe in it, not because they understand it, but because they want attention. And 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 and, and they, they attach themselves to it for political clout um amongst a particular sect. And so you know it's like throw out the boogeyman, folks are scared, you champion it, some folks are uninformed, wrap themselves around it, they create all these false theories and concepts around it create this impossible thing, like they're teaching critical race theory to kindergartners. First of all, ain't no kindergartner understands critical race theory, first and foremost. Um, and if they were, I'd be very impressed and I would send them right to law school. Number two, it's a theoretical framework. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a set of principles that you may utilize to make sense of your practice, but it's not your practice per se. Social cultural theory is a theoretical framework. Critical race theory is a theoretical framework. Like there are, there are variations of them and scholars and thinkers use frameworks to be able to make sense of their work, even if they don't make, even if they don't really employ the framework. I use a bunch of frameworks. I use post-colonial frameworks to make sense of the experience of young folks in classrooms, but I'm not necessarily teaching post-colonial theory to young folks. It's helping me to make sense of how they're impacted by structures that are akin to a colonial superstructure. But it, as it plays out in the class, it was like, yo, if this colonial shit plays out in real life, historically, how do I make sure that young folks are seeing themselves as whole and welcome and not ascribing to structures that make them feel as though they're not smart? I'm not teaching post-colonial theory. Post-colonial theory is informing how I think about what I do in a classroom. That practical work is informed by the theory. I ain't teaching the theory, but my practice at the end of the day is just good teaching. Right. And so, you know, don't fall for the okie doke, beloved. Like, just do your work. Um, you're making too much sense. It's, it's scary. Um, so here's a question from Tristan. Uh, when we talk about using identity as pedagogy, don't we risk turning the experience into therapy rather than interrogation and exploration and a way of understanding the culture? Uh, because, you know, here's the thing. In, in my work, what I, what I argue for is that experience does have value. In so much as if learning is embedded in experience, it allows for the intellectual pursuits to be increased. So let me let me break it down a little bit more. Because when I get the overview, I couldn't get into it. By the way, a lot of this is in a book, copy the book. So I'm 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 a teacher engaging with you know with, with my guy Jason here, right? I don't know Jason. We met for the first time today. If I'm gonna teach Jason, I can teach him whatever I want to, how to balance an equation, for example. 
And I can just say, hey, Jason, when you have a chemical equation, it's put in this way. You have to find out what you do with the subscript on each side. I can give that to him. I'm teaching Jason's mind. Jason may have the ability to be able to soak in that information. However, if I want that information to stick to Jason, I'm like, yo, Jason, how are you doing today, man? Oh, I'm doing all right. What did you do today? Oh, I went to this place. Uh, how's it been at the free library so far? Man, it's been crazy. Sometimes I have to carry books from the first floor to the third floor. And sometimes I have to have the same amount of books on each floor. Boom. Now I'm like, oh, that's Jason's experience. Jason talked about carrying books from one floor to the other to have the same amount of books in one place as the other. Through Jason's experience, the experiential knowledge becomes the anchor through which I engage in the pet, the content. I am a believer in content knowledge. Yeah, I, I don't know if folks understand this. I'm an anthobio. I got mad degrees in the sciences. You know what I mean? I love science. I teach science. I also understand that for me to teach Jason science, I have to value Jason's experience, Jason's reality. So I begin with the carrying of books across floors and having the same amount of books in each floor. Then I connect that to the content. And so people say, well, isn't experience just like a therapeutic release? No, it's a therapeutic, it's a therapeutic release of where you come from if you leave it there. My work, as opposed to other folks' work, like I don't end at the hugs. I love the hugs. But I, I begin with the hugs. Then I say, how do we engage in the hugs as it connects to being successful academically, intellectually? I want black and brown kids getting degrees. I don't want them to be smart. I want them to be intellectual. I just don't want them to do it at the expense of their humanity. And that requires censoring the experience. Hence, my framework for reality pedagogy, which is how the teachers make sense of the realities of young folks' experiences. Now, we can articulate our realities, but our ratchet realities are our core identities like the, the piece of ourselves that sticks to your gut. So you go beyond, you know, I think don't devalue experience is what I'm trying to say. Experience becomes the entry point to have conversation about culture. Culture becomes the entry point to force connections to content. And once connections to content have been made, you open up the space for you to be able to get people to be able to engage in anything academically and intellectually. And here's the thing, otherwise, you're, by, you're, you're battling them the whole time. I'm telling Jason, Jason, why don't you understand what's to do with the subscript? Jason, just do this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to feed Jason's mind and I ain't touch Jason's soul. And the soul must be activated through experience so I can open up the capacity of the mind to engage in the rigorous academic exercises. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll try to get to as many of these as possible. This is from Cheryl. What chapter would you recommend I share with my students? I love what you're sharing and the various stories you share. Uh, I will be using this book uh, with them. So, oh, which, give thanks, man. I, I love that. I, I, I don't want folks to understand, like, you know, people oftentimes say, like, you know, I'm. This is a book for teachers. Nah, it's a book for anybody who engages in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a book for anybody who's in the pursuit of success or better. And, and, and loses themselves in the process and need to remarry themselves back to themselves. And it's a book for young folks. I think young folks can, I think young people can understand that Oreo chapter. Be like, I, I think that chapter, they can make sense of it. They could decode it. They can make applications to how do you think it connects to your life or your experiences? Like I would, I would do the Oreo chapter. Um, oh, definitely the elevators, haters and suckers chapter. So like that chapter is like how, like these are, these are, to me, it's like, it's, it's the map for how I navigate life. And I think if young folks, if all folks understood how to deal with the elevators in their lives, the haters in their lives and the suckers in their lives and, un, and, and develop the discernment to be able to treat folks accordingly, like life would be easier. So I would say either the Oreo chapter or, um, or the elevators, haters and suckers chapter, if you want to get the young folks. Okay, uh, Kay Maria Boswell asked, is it possible to view imposter syndrome in this context as a maybe necessary part of the self-talk owning one's ratchet demic reality. Yeah. Now, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not, so, I, and you when, you, when you get to the joint, you see that I'm not demeaning the concept of imposter syndrome. It's real. How I know it's real, I felt it, <laughs> right? So I, like, I, I, I do think that we can sit in that feeling and then understand why we have that feeling and then understand who's made up, who's made us have those feelings and then question whether or not those feelings are legitimate or not. And, and then, and then come out on the other side of it, understanding that 
98% of the time, you, you are suffering from a syndrome that like is not real because your excellence surpasses that. And the folks that you are, that this is the thing I'm trying to get at in this book and in, 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 that, in that chapter where I talk about, about this journey is like the folks who you are judging yourself by, like you're like, oh my gosh, look at those excellent people who, who are making me feel like I'm an imposter and I'm not as good as them. Them cats is whack. Like the nine times out of 10, the people who you're comparing yourself to as being better than you, ain't better than you. Like one of my favorite sayings, the only person better than you isn't better than you. Once you've done the self work to understand the self within you, you start realizing those folks is trash and you can do exactly what they do academically and intellectually, except with a certain je ne sais quoi that, that allows you to be able to elevate your ability to engage in academic content, right? So, so no, so, so, so yes, imposter syndrome can be a seedbed for more deep interrogations of self. It should be a trigger for a questioning of the circumstances one is embedded in so that one can get an accurate read of who they authentically are and recognize that oftentimes um, the folks who are judging you are the imposters because they ain't got no ratchet. <laughs> um, so there's two questions I want to get to here and we're a little pressed, but we got, we could go a little bit over it. Um, and there was a, there's a good one to end on, but I wanted to hit this one first from Eric Newman. I'm a 40 year old white guy who grew up in the suburbs. Uh, I teach remedial math at an urban community college. My classes are typically a third white born in the US, a third black born in the US and a third immigrants from across the globe, primarily majority Muslim nations. I find it hard to connect culturally with the entire class at one time. And my attempts to switch between different aspects of my personality seem to come off as inauthentic pandering because we don't know each other well enough to recognize the complexity of our authentic selves. Advice for being, Ratchetemic in this multicultural setting. Be don't try to be like them. Try to be like you. Like I, I'm, it's it's it, like literally. So there's a there's a there's a section in the book where I talk about golf ratchet and the stories that I was giving a speech about ratchetness to this dude, white dude. Um, and he was like, I don't understand why we talk about ratchet. It's absolutely ridiculous. Blah blah. blah. And the, the story ends with him saying, Oh my gosh, I have a friend and my friend is golf ratchet. And I was like, Golf ratchet? I don't know about this. And as we talked further, what he meant was he had a friend who he played golf with who had like an awful swing and did not understand any golf decorum. And he would not take him out on a golf outings with his golf friends, but like played the game well. And so what I would say is like, oftentimes what we do in those multicultural settings is trying to find ways to use our personality to connect with different audiences. And that's not what I'm asking us to do. I'm asking you to do a deep interrogation into who you are. Like, so my, I'll, I'll say to you, like, who are you when you're home with the folks who love you the most? Um, like, not, not an aspect of your personality, because an aspect of your personality is a persona that you're performing. That's not going to cut it. I'm talking about who are you. So, like, and that's where the deep sufferer comes, right? So who am I with the person who loves me the most? When, when I want my children, am I, am I jovial? Am I a storyteller? Am I kind? Am I loving? You tap into that self. In the last chapter of the book, that talks about the rights of the body. Once you start doing the work of giving yourself the right to be here, the right to see, the right to love and be loved, your authentic self emerges. You, we are only experts in our own selves and our own experiences. We must learn to lead with our authentic selves first. Now, what you'll inevitably find happening is that once you show up as your full self, as the instructor, you give your class the permission to show up as their full self. So you're, you're performing, they're performing, no one's learning. You're your full self, unconcerned about them, just fully you. Then all of a sudden they're like, yo, this person, he's like, he's himself. I'll give an aspect of myself. Now, all of a sudden, the, you, you start developing. So the currency is the authenticity, not the performance of what you might think will make other people feel comfortable. And so I would just say, yo, dive more deeply into you, so much so that you give them no choice than to be themselves. Then all of a sudden, authenticity has conversation with authenticity. And then you start co-constructing not a, not a performed self, but you start co-constructing what the rules of engagement are in that classroom because that one Muslim student will now crack a joke. Now it's not about being Muslim anymore. It's about having a sense of humor, right? So like that Muslim student with a sense of humor will connect to that black student with a sense of humor. And then all of a sudden the sense of humor becomes the primary method of discourse amongst that population. So it's delve deeply into your authentic self, not a performance of a persona. And that will give the class permission to be themselves then you start constructing what the rules of engagement are around expressions of authenticity in the classroom. 
Um, and yo, for for the for the brother who just sent that message or anybody else, hit me up on on um Twitter or something, so we could keep the conversation going because I know we're about to run out of time on here, and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going because I don't want to give like short answers like I have all the answers. I do want to give like some nods towards where you can go, but engage with me on on socials, and we could go in even deeper. Okay. Well, that was from Eric Newman. So if you hear from him, you hear you hear from him. All right, Eric. I see. I you. think that's just good life advice in general. Um, what you're talking about. So. Um, so as I was reading the book, I, and, and I think this is a good way to end on sort of the practicality of bringing this, I started reading it and I, I, I find the ideas really interesting. And I, I was asking myself, um, how do we bring this, you know, into reality? How do you bring this to places? And uh, the, the last question I, I'm, I'm able to get to here says, uh, it's kind of on the same note, um, but it's about, again, these practical matters of what are your suggestions on how to move a high school away from hyper focus on standardized tests uh, to more authentic forms of learning, um, you know, such as such as this framework that you're talking about. How do we how do we bridge that gulf, you know, between theory and application, between this idea and 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 bringing it to schools? So a couple of things I would say, you know, um, for white folks teaching the hood, which is my previous book outlines a set of really practical, tangible practices for teachers to be able to implement every single day that can get us there. Rashademic offers the things that wrap around those practices. I, I really feel like a combination of those two books in the hands of any educator will give you a way to bring this down to like, the, you know, to the soul of it. It's the first thing I'll say. The second thing I'll say is like, ask them, is what we're doing working? Like, here's the thing that bugs me out the most, Jason. I'll be in a school, they're doing this age old drilling, kill, test, prep, respectability, pass the test, drill, whatever nonsense. And the test score is still trash. And I'm like, yo fam, so let's just be honest with each other. Is the approach to instruction that is currently being implemented in this space really meeting the goals that you say you want? The answer is no. How do you convince folks to do something different? Show them that what they're doing ain't working. Like seriously, it, it's it's that simple. I think also another piece of it is, you know, what inevitably happens when you create the kind of context that welcome or academic approach to teaching and learning is that young folks have agency, have voice, and they want to be able to, and they, they they like they're like, man, I want more of this. And I always say, if you want to convince folks to do a different approach to teaching and learning, let the young folks who've been impacted by the good teaching articulate it. You know, it shouldn't be a bunch of teachers saying, I did this and my kids are learning. Okay, fine, the kids are learning. Let the kids, let the kids talk to the world about how they're learning. The best evidence of my work is the kids who are in Science Genius writing those science raps and performing them on stage and graduating from college. What now when the evidence of what you said you wanted is happening? And I'll make the argument a lot of folks keep doing the same thing and saying they want different results because they don't want different results. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into conspiracy theory here, you know, school funding from a lot of school districts are based on the underperformance of certain young folks. So if the educator is interested in interrupting that process, they start employing a different approach to pedagogy that involves a reality pedagogy, that involves a academic approach to instruction. So I would say, you know, use them seven seeds of reality pedagogy, have young folks articulate what's working for them and what's not, and then show and prove with how young folks are engaging with the content. That, that always works. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I could do this all night, but uh, this has been terrific. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you, everybody at home, for your questions. Um, Christopher Emden, the book is Ratchetdemic. As you know, it's terrific. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And everybody at home, uh, like we said, visit our friends at Uncle Bobby and uh, check it out. And in the meantime, check out our schedule for the rest of the fall season and uh, keep reading. Uh, Christopher, thank you again so much. And My have pleasure a to be here with you. Thank you so much.